for lights on or lights yeah. off for a Saturday morning? On. Off. On. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we'll just uh, let the rest of the folks grab the last little bit of uh, stuff there, and then we'll get started. Um, while you're grabbing that, I'm Jenny Crooks. I'm the Arts Program Specialist for the Office of Arts and Culture. I manage their community-based programs. Um, so two of them that fall under that are the Neighborhood and Community Arts uh, Program, which we'll be going over today, and the Put the Arts in Parks Program. A couple of the other programs that I manage that, that are in our opportunities brochure right there which uh, outline our funding is um, the, our Smart Ventures which is our small arts uh, funding program and then our Work Readiness Arts program which is our partnership with the Seattle Youth Violence Prevention Initiative. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention this is really just to tape this. What we'll do is once this is over uh, early next week we'll post this to the web so if you're from an organization and you're not necessarily writing the grant, but somebody else's, that's sort of a resource, or if you need to go back and refer to it, it'll be a resource for you to use later on. So just look at our, visit our website again um, to follow up with that. Um, uh, Randy, if you'll just do a quick introduction sure. as well. Hi, I'm Randy Weiger with City of Seattle Parks and Recreation, and I'm here to help answer any specific questions about to put arts in the parks grant, or really any questions about holding events in a public park, Thank regardless you. of the funding source. Um, so with that in mind, like I said, is we'll be going over the two of uh, both of these programs. There's a couple of reasons for it. Practically, they're both open and closing at the same time. They're also going through the same application um, portal. So as far when we cover the application side of things and how to apply, it, it's the same steps. Also, um, we are allowing this year because they are coming from it because Put the Arts in Parks is our partnership with Seattle Parks and Recreation. It is technically coming from two different pools of funding, so there are some ways in which you're you might be eligible for both of those programs depending on where your project is happening um, or where your projects are happening. So we wanted to make sure that you knew about both opportunities and where you might be able to fit in. If you have a question at any time, feel free to raise your hand and I'll try and answer it then. If I know that I'll be covering it in a little bit more detail, I might just ask you to hold on to it for a moment so we don't get too sidetracked. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, the objective, basically what we'll be covering or what I'm hoping to cover uh, this morning is reviewing the project guidelines once again for both of those funding programs how to apply uh, essentially how to use our online system when it comes to applying it for those who aren't familiar um, and then also the quirks of this particular funding if you've applied before using culture grants online it's a little bit also about the quirks of this year because we have two programs running simultaneously um, and then uh, what makes for a strong application looking ahead and any other questions that might come up at the end. So this is kind of a brief rundown of the neighborhood and community uh, neighborhood and community arts program. This is really just fun specifically neighborhood arts councils and community groups and to support festivals or events. Uh, the key being that they're reoccurring events so they need to they need to have been produced at least once before um, and have some sort of kind of history within the community that they're serving. Those events should promote arts and cultural participation, so there should be a significant arts component with the event. Uh, it should these um, this particular program was created to help celebrate diversity in our community. It's also to build community and enhance the visibility of neighborhoods and communities. And I use community to mean both geographic community as well as cultural community uh, within Seattle, and then also to support our underserved communities. Um, with this particular funding. The Put the Arts in Parks program, this one um, is the partnership with Seattle Parks and Recreation. Randy's back there if you have any questions about specifically related to that. Um, and once again, there is some overlap on here, so you'll see it. That it does support neighborhood arts councils, community-based groups, and also individual artists that might be serving especially underserved communities or from underserved communities. And when we say underserved, if anybody has any questions about that, that can often mean uh, demographically underserved, so communities of color, immigrant or refugees communities, and the like, low-income communities, if, uh, if they're parts of uh, geographic parts of Seattle that 
typically don't have a lot of these events, so that's really important to this program as well. Um, once again, it can be events, concerts, classes, etc. This one uh, could be a series of classes or workshops that are taking place uh, in a city of Seattle Park. They should also promote arts and cultural participation, build community, uh, ce celebrate diversity, um, and activate. This one is different than neighborhood, of uh, neighborhood and community arts, which can happen anywhere within the city of Seattle. Put the Arts and Parks is really specific to city of Seattle parks and outdoor parks. So even if a, the community center is a facility, a, a parks and recreation facility, it's really meant for the outdoor park areas. And this one, different, uh, our Neighborhood and Community Arts is a two-year funding program, so you'll, you'd get 1,200 for both 2016 and you'd be rolled over for 1,200 in 2017. This is just a one-year funding program. In, um, it's its pilot year, so we're just tar starting it out, especially as a one-year program, until we see how that goes. But you can apply every year. Yeah, you can it's apply like every year. It's matching fund where you, you have Thank it you. a bit once and that's it. This you can come back to, yeah. but it'll be competitive with everybody else. And it, once again, it is the pilot year of the program, so we're starting, we're creating it as best we can this year to get the money, the money was approved, uh, I guess September, early in September, and we sort of rolled out with it as quickly as we could because it needs to be used in 2016. So just when in saying that, we're hoping that 2017 funding will also come, but there may be some tweaks and changes and those sorts of things as we learn how this year goes. Um, for both of these programs, this is the uh, rough timeline as far as application funding and contracting go. So October 30th is the deadline for both of these applications. Um, November through early December, a community panel will be looking through the applications and uh, helping to make decisions. The By the end of December, hopefully, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, it might be early January for the Put the Arts in Parks program. Um, notification letters will go out to the projects that were selected. And then January through December of 2016 is when the events will take place. For the Put the Arts in Parks, um, we're really hoping that those events will be February till December 2016. I don't think for Put the Arts in Parks, because those are outdoor festivals, I don't think too many will be applying for January to begin with. But if there is an issue, uh, you might let me know. Um, within 30 days following the event or by December 31st, whichever comes first, if you are selected, you'll need to then submit your uh, final reports and evaluations and request for payment at that time. Uh, for Put the Arts in Parks, there's a little thing down here. That one is, um, that will be December 15th. Once again, I'm hoping that's not too much of an issue because most of your events probably won't be happening outdoors the last week of December. <coughs> okay, so this is really a question about are you um, going over the guidelines and requirements? Are you eligible is a real uh, question. And which of these programs are, are you, your organization, or your project eligible for? For neighborhood and community arts, here's the basic rundown of the applicant requirements. Like I said, it should have been previously produced, so your organization needs to be in existence for at least a year. For both of these programs, you do not need to be 501c3. Uh, and if you want, you can go through a fiscal sponsor. That's okay. Uh, you don't need to go through a fiscal sponsor um, as long as you either have a um, tax ID number or if you're applying as an individual, you'd be applying under your social security a number for receiving, those fund for receiving that funding. Um, for neighborhood and community arts, we consider this one of our core funding programs. So this one has been around for a while. And what we try to do is keep folks from double dipping too much. Uh, and so for this one, you cannot be funded through any of other core arts programs. So that includes our Civic Partners Program, Smart Ventures Program, um, or City Artist Program. If you are funded through our Youth Arts Program, that is okay. If you have any questions about this or I'm speeding through it, let me know. Yeah. For an uh, individual artist as an applicant, how do you define the existing form as a, like a... Uh, for this one, the organ, the community, um, for neighborhood and community arts, like I said, is it's really meant for community groups. Mm -hmm. 
So if it's not an official formalized group under a 501c3 or under that has formed with a tax ID number, um, that group should have some history of working together. So even if it's a group of neighbors that come together to throw a block party or an art, you know, an arts walk or something like that, um, you should it, most likely you produce the event at least once before, right? So it would have happened at least for a year. Um, the individual artists, yeah. we are allowing for the put the arts in parks. Right. So that one is not under the NCA requirements. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And like I said, is for NCA, you can technically apply as an individual if you aren't a formalized group. So it could be an individual applying, but when you're talking about the project and the organization, that group should have had some sort of um, gathering at some point. So could it be that we have done a project related to the work in the past, related to the project we're proposing? Mm -hmm. it does need to be exactly the same thing with coverage? It doesn't need to be exactly the same thing. So sometimes folks do, a, a easy an easy example I can give is if you're a theater group, um, you and you perform outside in a park or you do a community outdoor theater performance it doesn't have to be the same play from year to year to year to year it could be a different play so if it as long as there's a, if it's a um, it's sometimes the neighborhood and community arts uh, are associated with like a cultural month and it doesn't need to be the same exact celebration of it sometimes that cultural celebration takes the form of uh, music, a music or a, uh, sharing the traditional music of that country and then the next uh, it might be a play or something like that but there's some reoccurring element to it if you have any questions about it like I said I'm happy to talk to you more if our funding ends this year can we apply for this? yes yeah. um, when it says that Arts councils or community-based groups can apply. Does that include nonprofit arts organizations? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So community-based is a little bit could mean anything. So. Yeah, and we're trying to kind of keep it. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, arts okay. groups can apply. All right. So is this like the one that has to be outside? No, this is a neighborhood and community group. Uh, okay. Neighborhood and community arts. This can happen anywhere in Seattle as long as it's open to the public. So. Just going over the project uh, requirements, like I said, the project needs to have been previously produced or the event or whatever it is needs to be reoccurring and previously produced. Once again, this is for the neighborhood and community arts. This is one of our core programs. Let me just go through the list and I'll be right with you. Um, it has to have, once again, it has to have a significant arts and cultural component. This one has to be open to the public, so it can't just be for like your members based or donors or something like that. It does need to be open to the public. That doesn't necessarily mean um, there is a difference. It doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be free. You can have a suggested donation or something like that. But once again, uh, accessibility is important to both of these funding programs. So if your um, you know, entry price is $50, how accessible is that to most of Seattle? So you know, that's something to keep in mind. Um, Take place, and this one, once again, needs to take place in the city of Seattle. It does not need to be in a park for neighborhood and community arts. It just needs to take place somewhere in the city of Seattle and be open and accessible to the public. Uh, especially for the South End folks, if you're doing an event down there, double check that it is in the city of Seattle. There's some areas of unincorporated Seattle that technically we are not able to fund. So if you have a question about your location, let me know. Um, and this one, as far as how you're applying, while it's a two-year funding program, you would be um, your application would essentially be falling for the Janu describing the event for the January to December 2016. I know for some folks it's already like jumping ahead. You don't necessarily know who's already on board and stuff like that. So we're mainly looking at what information you have for 2016 coming up. Now this is the Put the Arts in Parks program. So this is the one that needs to happen in City of Seattle Parks. There is some redundancy to the applica um, applic application. So you do not need to be a 501c3. Um, once again, a fiscal sponsor is okay. For this one, you can be funded through our other core arts programs. Because it is a partnership and the funding is coming from outside of our office, um, you can't, 
you can have a couple of different programs. We're trying to throw as wide a net as we possibly can, for the, especially for this pilot year. Um, and then if you look on the guidelines, we have different funding levels that you can apply for. For the applicant, you have to have a history of producing if you're applying for the 2400 level or more. If you're applying for the 1200 level, if this is the first time you've done it, if it's a group of youth that have an idea that they want to put together, they can apply for the, and they've never produced anything before um, and haven't worked together as a group before, they can apply for the 1200 level. Make sense? I'm sorry, um, I sort of rushed through. Did you have a question? Still? Miss in the back. Did you, ha did you still have that question or did I cover it? Yes, I was wondering about if it had to be free. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> so, this one, um, the project new, as far as project requirements go, it needs to be, uh, we're funding new and existing projects would be considered. So if you've produced this in a park before, that's fine. If you haven't produced in a park before, that's fine. If it's the first time, if you usually do indoor stuff and this is the first time you're doing something in a park, that's fine as well. So um, once again, like the other one, it does need to have a significant arts and cultural component. So that has to be cle um, clear. And then, um, your question, for this one, it does need to be free and open to the public. Um, and this one also, like I said, needs to take place in a city of Seattle park. If you look at the guidelines for Put the Arts in Parks, there's a list of preferred parks um, on there. Yeah. Um, can we do the whole components Yeah. For, well, for Put the Arts in Parks, I'll go over that a little bit more, but food is food is allowed, but uh, there is a cap on it. I have a question about the history of producing. I'm an individual artist, and in the past, I've produced events as part of an organization. Would I be able to count that as history of production, or would I need to go for the lower? Because I have a project that's different from what I've done before, and I would be doing something as an individual, but I've run for, and you're asking specifically for put the arts in parks. Yeah. That I think should count. We'll see how it, um, okay. once the application, there might be some question. Okay, because I wouldn't want to disqualify myself from getting anything if. I think you know, that should count. That sounds to me like it should count. It doesn't necessarily need to, as long as you have some background and capacity. What we don't want to do is because these are um, higher levels than some of our other community based funding, we want to make sure that there's some uh, background and feasibility to it and mm -hmm. folks aren't just asking for the highest amount because that's really tempting and why not ask for more money. Yeah. I think for the 2400 and higher levels we're looking to see something that gives us confidence yeah. that you have produced events, you understand some of the complexity of putting an event on. Yeah. So if, if you can demonstrate that on your application, I think yeah. that should okay. address that okay. requirement. Thank you, Randy. Oh, and just one moment. I want to introduce this gentleman right here. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Judd. I'm the manager of Magazine Park and also Park Activation. And uh, Randy and I have been working with the Office of Arts and Culture to implement the, the Arts in the Park program. So I'm glad you're all here to listen to the information. And I'm here to, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to Brian. Brian. Brian, yeah. yeah, so if you have any questions about this funding or any other kind of parks information or the um, the, the passing of the additional funding for parks, yeah. they're the folks to, to help you out with that. Do we need to get on the calendar for the, <clears throat> the parks? Um, do we need to get on the parks calendar before it happens to make sure that we can produce? So do they need to have a parks permit already approved at the time of that? No, they can do that afterwards. No, you can do that afterwards. <laughs> and you can now submit applications for an event in the park up to a year ahead of the event. For years, there you couldn't apply until January. Now it's a rolling deadline. So if your event is in June, you could apply already for next year's event in June. There's a new, a new um, expanded service of our event schedule. But no, you do not have to have a permit already submitted or approved in order to apply. But if you're planning on going ahead with your program, whether you get this funding or not, and this just helps you enhance some fun, you know, enhance the program or try something new with it, um, and you know that your programs, it sounds like you can apply now. And there are um, 
There are some sheets they might have all been taken, but it's also available on our website. There's uh, an outline of the permits that you would need if you're doing um, uh, an event in the parks. Um, on the list of preferred parks, does that mean that any applications have to be in one of these parks, or should include some of these parks? Like, how mandatory is this? Yeah. So they are preferred parks. They're not, uh, but all parks are eligible uh, as long as it's managed by the city of Seattle. So. Um, I got a call from somebody asking if the park next to the school that they, like attached to the school, not just next, attached to the school, they wanted to do something in there and unfortunately that wasn't eligible because it wasn't a city of Seattle managed park. So just because there's trees and right. grass on it doesn't necessarily right. mean if, it's eligible. If you have a question, there's a list of all 400 or so of the city parks on right. the city parks webpage, which is seattle.gov slash parks. And then on our navigation bar, you click on parks and it says A to Z list of parks. So if you find your park on that list, it's a city yeah. scale park, right? right? Now, and under, um, to go on top of that, so the reason why the, we have this list of preferred parks are these were identified and Randy and Brian can go over the, the process a little bit more. But these were identified as parks needing specific activation. They will not be the permanent list, so each year, and that's why we haven't limited it to this because we know there are other parks that need activation for different reasons. But these were some key parks that were addressed for um, needing activation. And so these are preferred parks that will get you a potential little bump in your um, in your scoring if you're applying through the Put the Arts and Parks program. If your park is not listed on here, um, it's still eligible and there's still potential for being funded through it. It's just a matter of how well they meet those other uh, requirements and criteria that I'll be going on in, in a little bit more detail. Um, some parks are not, um, I'll be with you in one moment, but some parks... I have a uh, second part too. So. Sure. The downtown uh, parks, for instance, they receive a lot of funding, so this will be taken into consideration. It doesn't, once again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't be, a project won't be funded in there, but um, it, it, you can the, provide exactly so, how much or so the context. So the downtown parks, so, you know, like Occidental, <coughs> Park, Victor Steinbreck, Westlake Plaza, and, and a, a host of others, you have know, received a tremendous amounts of funding each year for the last 10 years. They have lots of activities like Dancing Till Dusk and all kinds of activities like that. And there hasn't really been any funding source for parks outside of the downtown core area. That's what this program is intention is. So we haven't disqualified the downtown parks, but part of the review process would be looking at how many events are being hosted in a downtown park already that would have an effect on how competitive a proposal from this funding source for a downtown park would be. Yeah, the philosophy with this funding really was and is to bring activation into the neighborhood. So that's why you can see this spread that Jenny has up on the slide. Mm -hmm. And if, like, let's say you wanted to do something at Camp Long. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to do it in the lodge there, or it really has to be outside all the time? Outside. Yeah, outside. we okay. consider Camp Long an environmental learning center, uh -huh. and not exactly a neighborhood park. Okay. Yeah. Does that mean that Camp Long is disqualified? No. Okay. But we would look at look how at many, it. you know, how many activities are already going on there? Because it's already. Right. I was yeah. just thinking of a place that has an indoor option. Yeah, no, right. we want outdoor. Outdoor, outdoor okay. you yeah. can use the pavilions, I assume, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. just like, yeah, okay. like the pavilions count. Right. So if you're like, we're doing this rain or shine, yeah. and you know that you need to have <laughs> some, cover some coverage, yeah. um, I think the pavilions count in, as an outdoor. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's less about what structures on it and how it's classified. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm looking at some of the lists in North Seattle, and I sort of wonder how many of these have <coughs> groups already associated with them. And, and the thing about community groups is sometimes they form and they fall apart, but they reform under the same name. Does that count as history? Um, um. For the put the so what are you at? Just, just in terms of you know, for some of these you want people who've had a history of doing these kind of events before, um, and 
So I'm looking at some of these and I'm like, is there a community group at Salmon Bay Park now uh, that can say they have a history of putting on events? Um, I hate to specify a program that's probably unfair to Salmon Bay Park. So are you looking at... Um, no, I'm, I'm not looking at any particular thing. I just, I, I had experience putting events on in parks. Um, and so I'm just kind of here to get information. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of looking at some of these and I'm wondering, okay, um, you have community groups who, sometimes community groups come together and then they fall apart and then they come back together into the same name. And they could argue, well, this community group has a history of doing events, but they've kind of fallen apart and come back together. Does, I don't know. I don't, I'm not so expressing. my feeling is that we're trying to be as open as possible. And if you can demonstrate some collective history of, of producing an event, that would count as having organizational background. Randy? I, I think the answer is, is similar to the, the one I responded to earlier. Is whoever the applicant is, you know, whether it's a group or an individual, if you want to apply for more than the $1,200 level, if you, you need to demonstrate in your application that there's some experience at putting on some kind of event. Not necessarily the event you're applying for, that could be a first time event, but just something that gives us confidence that you that that somebody in the in the applicant applicant or the, the group that's yep. applying has that experience to make this event successful. So it, it, it's, you know, if, and if you don't, you can still apply at the $1,200 level. That doesn't require any previous experience. Thank is that, is that okay. the issue? Okay. And as far as groups like already associated with these, if those group with these parks, if those groups want to apply to, you know, to help activate those parks in ways that they've already been doing, and want to enhance that activation, that's great. But we don't want to limit it to just those groups that are already associated with those parks. It might be a, a you know, a neighborhood group might already have a, have like a yearly event there. That's great, but maybe we want, maybe there's a cultural group that wants to use it to celebrate a, a, a holiday or something else and bring that to that area or neighborhood or it's a perfect layout or there's a history to the park that has a connection for that cultural cultural group and so it's not it shouldn't just be limited to the groups that might have a history in those parks yeah. um, I have a question about terminal 107 park we just did a mini commute journey mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and ended up at the wrong house right um, that was stellar Right, that's the Duwamish Reveal, yes. yeah, which is fabulous. Well, we're Wano. Yeah. We're yeah. welcome to our native land and collaborating to do that mm -hmm. with them. So, do you want to stop but it's owned by the port, not the city. Okay, the that's what I want to start. Yeah, yeah but, but uh, nearby in South Park, there's the Duwamish Waterway Park that has river access. That is the city the park. Well, that's what I was wondering. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder no more. Yeah. And um, is it on the list? Yes, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So you might get a few extra points in the scoring if you're going to do an event. Well, that would be good because we have five canoe paddles commissioned by coastal carvers, intertribal from various areas. And our idea is to get do a bronze project, bronze them, and then have them installed in a park near that area. So, so um, it sounds like you're you or your organization has experience doing an event before, so that would be good. Um, and and so this funding source is for activities. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure about the bronzing and the installation. I mean, I imagine there's other funding sources that could address that. Well, there's two. But, there's. But, sorry. Go on. Yeah. But this would be for activities, so it might be. Yeah. You know, if you do that bronzing and have them installed and then want to have a, an event to okay. celebrate that, this would oh, yeah. be the funding source for the event part. Okay, okay, that, okay. that's good. Yeah, Fair. we do have another program, uh, not to confuse things further, we do have another program associated with Put the Arts in Parks that's specifically for um, artists interested in doing temporary artwork, so temporary public art in, in parks. There will be a couple of um, 
workshops for that if you wanted to take a look at our web. What's um, that called? But, but this, but your project sounds more It's fun. not, it's a more permanent one, but I did want to say that yeah. if you're thinking of, because she meant brought up installation, mm -hmm. there is an also um, a funding program that does that. So that's a separate thing that you'd be applying for. If any of these projects are really temporary installation projects, that would go through a different what is application. That, what is that program? That's called Put the Arts in Parks as well, but it's temporary activation for it. Here. Yes, yeah. it's here. Yeah. I can pull it up and let you know what those are. I have a question related to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, since we are doing things outdoors, uh, what is the, the, the logistical and technical support you can get from of any from the other parts of the it depends on the park, and that's handled by our event scheduling office. When you apply for the permit to hold your event in the park, there'll, there'll be questions on the form, and there'll be interaction with the staff. You know, some parks have electricity, some don't. Um, so it depends on the specific park. And are you anticipating any kind of support something? I mean, I think I'm available for what we call technical assistance. If you, you know, if you're saying, well, we want to do this and we're not sure how to do this, I can, I've done, I work with lots of community groups to do events in parks over the years. Yeah, that, yeah, that's so I kind can. of, that's when I pop up when we write applications. Yeah, and, and you're welcome to contact me before submitting if okay. you have specific questions or, or you know, or you're not sure about some aspect of your application. I can say, oh, no, that sounds like what people do or, oh, you know, this is, or, you know, oh, for this situation, here's a common, you know, uh, ways of addressing that. I'm just going to pass my cards out through the group in case you have follow up. So if you have any questions about specific, once again, if you're applying for the Put the Arts in Parks, if you have any specific questions about parks, or if you're constrained by when, um, when your event needs to take place, while it's not required to get that permit, it's always a good idea to check in and say, Hey, are you scheduled for the month of May on the second week? You know, is, is there already a big event happening in this park? Or we really want to do an event and we'd like it to happen at perhaps one of these three parks, which would be the best one. So um, it's, it's best to contact them to at least see if it's available. You don't have to get all those permits and whatever else necessarily prior. Um, the last thing that I do want to mention, so this preferred park, it, when we're, as we're talking about parks, um, for the Put the Arts in Parks, we said it could be like a series of events. So say it's a, a class that's happening throughout the summer, it's just going to be like an open dance workshop or something, a dance class that people can just come to um, on Thursdays in the evening, early evening. Um, but instead of it happening at just one park, you want it to happen at three parks. That all counts as one project. So you'd apply for that series of series of events or series of whatever, and that would be all under one project. You wouldn't say, I, you know, my one class and this is the project, my other class is going to be this application. Um, so they can happen in more than one park. If you're doing an event uh, or a project, it can also happen more in more than one park. And it could happen in a combination of parks. Say you wanted it to be in a larger park or a regional park that's not on this list, and then you wanted a couple of other satellite events happening that were on this preferred list. So I'm just going to go through. This is my like quick little Venn diagram so that you know what your options are now that I've gone over all the requirements. So for NCA, if your event is um, for NCA, it's two years of funding, so 1,200 each per year. It needs to be a previously produced event, so it has to have some history of that particular project slash event. Um, the event can happen anywhere in Seattle, and it cannot already be funded in 2016 by one of our core arts programs, so Civic Partners NCA Smart Ventures City Artist. On the other side, the Put the Arts in Parks, this one is eligible for one year of funding at these various levels. It can be a new or existing event. It must take place in a city of Seattle park. And then it's okay if you're already funded by an arts uh, funding program for this one, as long as it's not for the same project. So here's where 
this middle section tells you where you can either submit, where your project is either eligible for both programs, or you can submit an application to both programs. So if the event has been previously reduced, takes place in a park, <coughs> and is free, you can actually submit your application to both Neighborhood and Community Arts and the Put the Arts in Parks. You would only get funding through one, but if you want to try your chances, you can submit your application to both. Does that make sense? So you just basically cut and paste the information from one application. Thankfully, the questions are exactly the same. So you just cut and paste your information from one application, the NCA application, and put it in the Put the Arts in Parks. It'll be considered for both of those, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, if it's selected for funding for both, we'd come back to you and say, hey, you're, getting, uh, you're eligible for you know, NCA, or you're eligible for this. Um, NCA, like I said, is limited to 1,200, but it's over a two-year period. Uh, and this one, you're, you could potentially be eligible for more, but some people like saying, hey, I'd rather stick with 1,200 and know that I'm definitely getting funded for two years than applying for 2,400. But that's really, we'll contact you if that's the case. Um, the other way that you're eligible to apply for both is if you have two different projects and each project meets those the corresponding programs um, requirements. So, for example, uh, there's a lot of Festal um, Seattle Center projects that are happening. Those are only eligible for NCA. However, if that Festal group or that festival that happens at Seattle Center wanted to do a smaller concert or dance showcase uh, happening either simultaneously the week before or whatever like a satellite festival in one of their neighborhood parks they could then apply for that satellite festival through put the arts and parks cool so what can be funded or what can you use the funding for so just a uh, recap over the types of funding. So NCA is two years of support, 1,200 for each year. The Put the Arts in Parks is one year of funding. Um, at those levels, like I said, if you're at 1,200, if you're requesting 1,200, you don't need to have any history of producing. Like I said, could be a youth, a uh, group of youth that wanted to apply that had never done anything, and they're really spearheading that event. Most likely, they'll need some sort of adult somewhere in the, in the, but they could apply for the 1,200 level. Um, anything above that, you need some history. While it's really, really tempting to apply for this level of funding, um, the issue is that, um, once again, think about your feasibility, think about your capacity, that the panel will be looking at that. So. Sometimes it's better to maybe scale back your event and know that it's going to happen the way you describe as opposed to um, just saying, we're going to apply for as much as we possibly can, especially if it's a new event. Is there a way of the application to say, like, get, if I were to get this budget, this is how I would do it, and this is how I could scale if I got this budget, to try to sort of say... So this year is a, um, because of the time frame, it's all or nothing. So whatever you're asking for, you'll either get it or you won't get it. And basically, the panel's looking at the budget and saying, is this feasible based on the funding that they've requested? Do they have a history of producing events at this level? You know, and does all of that make sense? So you kind of want to have a little bit of an internal conversation and say, what makes sense for me? And what do I feel confident going forward with? Once again, this funding can be, well, actually both funding can be used for any size events. We have events that are, you know, that report serving 15,000 people in one weekend. We have, we've supported events with our NCA program that have supported 50 people. But it's really about that and the impact of the event and the community that it's serving. And we measure impact, impact doesn't necessarily mean number of people. Can, can one organization apply for totally separate projects in each of these? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Okay. That's why I said if it's like those big festivals that's happening at Seattle fun. Center that's not eligible because it's happening indoors, you could apply for Neighborhood and Community Arts. But if that same festival were saying, hey, we really like being at Seattle Center, but we know that, it, that there's people that can't get there. So we want to make sure that we're out in the community as well, so we're going to do a satellite event this year. They could apply for this for the Seattle Center event and this for that satellite right. event. Okay. Are there things that are not supposed to be 
founded or think or everything you found is like these things in things? Um, as far as projects? Yeah. Or as far as what you can use the funding for? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the allow what you can use this funding for it can go towards artist fees. It can go this list is not necessarily exhaustive as far as allowable. It can go towards artist fees. It could be used for marketing. Once again, we are the Office of Arts and Culture, so we like to see when it's going towards artists. Um, uh, we know that artists are also willing to donate their time. So if that's um, if they're doing that, that's great. But know that we do like seeing the funding going towards artists and. Um, cultural costs. So artist fees, marketing and project management, project personnel costs, so the people who are specifically associated with the project, um, with that event. Um, the, it can go towards supplies, equipment rentals, it can be used for the parks permits that are on that uh, list if there's any costs associated with that. And for Put the Arts in Parks, I think you had a question about that, for Put the Arts in Parks only, we are allowing um, it to cover a portion of the food, 10% of the uh, requested funding can go towards food costs. Once again, 10% of the requested funding, so not necessarily 10% of the overall project. Anything above that would need to be covered by, it doesn't mean that you're limited to it, but our funding could pay for the 10% of it. Your, fun, your food costs could come from somewhere else if it's larger than that. Um, the unallowable, this is a pretty exhaustive list, so that's why I usually focus on this. It can't go towards fundraising, so if your event is a fundraiser for your organization, that is not allowable for either, um, for either one. It cannot go towards religious services uh, for either of these programs. Faith-based organizations can apply. It just can't go towards religious services. So if there's a faith-based organization that holds a festival out on it, or holds a festival out on its park, um, parking lot or on its grounds, that would still be eligible for a neighborhood and community arts funding as long as it wasn't religious, um, a religious service wasn't involved in it. Gifts and awards, so sometimes we get um, events, especially through our neighborhood and community arts that are like, um, community festival and dance competition. If there are awards associated with the dance competition or some sort of like gift or something of who's getting, who wins that, that would have to come from somewhere else. You can do it, we just can't pay for it. Um, regular organizational administrative costs that are above just the project-based organization costs cannot be covered through this. Um, and then different from here, so supply, we can fund equipment rentals, we cannot fund the purchase of equipment. So say you want to stay, you've done this the third year and you're like, it's really time for us to invest in a stage. Great, invest in a stage, we just can't pay for it. Um, but we could, if you want to continue renting it, we could cover that cost. And then last but not least, just for the NCA, food is not allowed at all. It's a smaller grant per year, so we really want to make sure that those are going to costs, um, hopefully associated with artist fees and stuff like that. I'm guessing that we could sell food? Okay. Once again, you can have food at your event, and it can be above and beyond. Yeah, we just can't fund it. Um, can you, now I saw the, for one of these, you could like double tip, but say a small sparks uh, or something like that, could you uh, partner a different kind of grant that isn't necessarily arts? So are you asking if, uh, if an event can receive funding from multiple city departments? Yeah. Okay. So, yes it can. Uh, none of these, none of this funding requires a match, so neither an NCA or um, put the arts and parks requires a match for it. It's good to show a match, whether it's in kind or non-cash. It's always good to show one because if you're a community event, you want to show some community investment in it. So I say in inevitably there usually is a match if you count up those volunteer and contributed costs, maybe not hard dollars. Um, the neighborhood matching fund does require a match. So you can apply and an event can be sponsored by both. But whatever you get, city funds cannot match city funds. So you couldn't use this funding to match, match name. Yeah, yeah, so whatever match you get for them would need to be above and beyond what you get from us. And is performance art considered art? Okay, 
so performances, cultural performances. And that. Mm -hmm. Concerts, music, dance, not limited to that. If you can think of something that's associated with it. That's the why, yeah. Yeah. You said, um, I noticed fundraising is not allowed, but you said a suggested donation at the door is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's basically, a lot of the time, um, some projects uh, uh, rely on the suggested donations to either fund that event this year or go into the pot for funding next year's event. So you can have a suggested donation at the door. Uh, two questions. Uh, I'm assuming that this, if we get this money, it would be taxed, right? Uh, you would get a, we would collect a W-9 from you, so yes. Okay, so you would probably allow for like a 10% taxes in that allotment for a budget of the allowable list. Do you know how that usually, I mean, I think we usually do if you put it in there, but, um, but for, if, if I understand the question, I, I think, I, I think the answer is <laughs> you, in your budget, you have a dollar amount you're paying project personnel. Right. And that would and be that's, part of the, and, and when you turn in your receipts, you'll show how much you paid that person at that point. It should how much, out. Of, how much of that is taxed and how much that goes in their pocket doesn't matter to us. It's all the dollar amount that you paid that person. Is that? Um, I guess I'm, if I if I apply for twelve hundred dollars and I say I need twelve hundred dollars for these things, but I don't actually get twelve hundred because I'm taxed ten percent of that to the government because I'm receiving money. But you should have your receipts to usually it balances out so that when you get that twelve hundred, you've paid out that twelve hundred. No, the question is, yeah. does the 1200 count as per personal income? Depends on how you're applying. Oh. So if you're applying as an organization, it would be under your um, tax ID, the organization's employee identification number or tax ID number. If you're applying as an individual, it would be under your social security number. So that W-9 would be associated with your social security number. So at the end of the year, I'm still going to have to pay 10% taxes out of the yeah. Well, the t yeah. But so the 1200 I mean, usually what you're doing is if you have those receipts and you put it, show that it's part of your, um, that those receipts were paid out, it's deductible. It's deductible how you do, depending on how you do your taxes. So it somewhat evens out. Now, if you're using some of that 1200 to pay yourself, then that's tax. Um, then that's taxed, but you wouldn't have included the tax in there. So usually you don't need to, that would either be covered under organizational costs associated with the project, okay. if there's things that you couldn't so that deduct. Would be within an artist fee. That would be within, then you'd be okay. paying the tax on that artist fee that you kept gotcha. to account okay. for your time. Yeah, I think cool. you're getting in the area where you need to consult an accountant yeah. on how you, how you process monies you yeah. receive, because there might be several strategies. Yeah. You know, with, because you're having essentially all the event costs run through your personal social security number, so that it reads as yeah. personal income, That's but you have these expenses uh -huh. that there may be a way to deduct. And again, I think that's where somebody is knowledgeable about taxing and not... Uh, and specifically your, yeah. right, like, does it make you sense know. to itemize or does it yeah, make I sense not to? So we can't really, like, yeah. I can't tell you, yeah. most yeah. likely you wouldn't need, um, most likely you would not be including those the 10% tax in the budget, in the budget okay. on there. Yeah, yeah that just, that's the lump sum that's paid to whatever, whoever you're paying, and then they have to figure out how much of that they owe in taxes, but that okay. doesn't affect us as the grant or in terms of the checks we yeah. write to you. Okay. okay, so then I guess relatedly, if uh, for my project I would want to be, a good chunk of the money would be to go pay out to other artists for contributing artwork to the event. Um, in which, like, I've never collected a W nine from anybody. And if it's under, know. if it's under, if you're not paying, if you're paying five ninety nine or below to oh, those so artists, like, you don't need to okay. collect a W nine. But they still need to show. But it they as should income. still. Yes. But they should uh -huh. show it as income. Okay, yes. so I can just like pass out money. It's their to responsibility. That doesn't. That counts as artist fees, not as gift. Correct. Okay. Again, you're so getting into territory where uh, somebody who understands tax. Well, I just want to make sure when I put yeah. a line item on the budget as I want to pay this artist to do something that you're not like, oh, no, that's artist a gift fees. or award and you're not eligible. Artist like, fees. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. An award would be like, I'm ha or a gift or award would be, I'm having 10, we're doing it, like I said, a competition. dance competition and first, third, and fourth. Thanks for that. But you could have 
you could use this funding source for an event and have awards at the event as long as the awards are not funded by, by this, this funding. Not funding from yeah. somewhere else. You could get funding, you could get a donate you could get the gift bag donated from local local uh, businesses, those kinds of things. So in a similar vein then um, if you're an organization and you're using a fiscal sponsor you could include that sponsor fee in your budget. That would be part of that project organization cost. Because they're the ones who are like then managing the payouts and that's a cost specifically associated with this project. So um, this is just the program criteria. This is essentially what the panel will be looking at for both of these programs. The quality of the project, so is there a strong arts component? Does it have a strong relationship to the neighborhood and community? Does it promote arts and community as well? The um, second criteria is community impact. So is it creating community and, uh, community and participation? Is it a benefit to the community it serves? Um, and does it reach a diverse audience? And lastly, the feasibility, is there a track record for NCA or the Put the Arts in Parks at the 2400 uh, level and above? Um, is there a community involvement or partner involvement? And lastly, does it have a realistic budget? So once again, does your budget kind of match your capacity as far as the Put the Arts in Parks? Once again, think about uh, not necessarily going for the highest. If you feel strongly about that, Go, go for the level of funding that you feel confident and strong about. That's what I'm basically trying to say. Any questions about the criteria? Once again, this is what the panel will be looking at. We do have a festival that's a particular ethnic group, but it's open to everyone. Is that okay? Yeah, definitely. It's totally fine. And in fact, I would highlight if it is for a specific ethnic group, if it's for um, immigrant refugees and it's produced by immigrant. Uh, Co uh, immigrant, refugee, or ethnic community, um, highlight that in your event. In fact, the Put the Arts in Parks is specifically, like I said, to serve underserved, uh, su serve and support underserved communities. So that support also fo follows under making sure that, w that that funding is going towards groups that uh, represent underserved communities that are trying to create those events as well. So and that's for both of them. Yeah. Chinese students. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yeah. So here's how we get into the actual application um, for the funding. <coughs> Excuse me. You can access each of these. So the Neighborhood and Community Arts, there's a link right here um, on our website. If you need that link, it should also be on the guidelines. You can also find it on our website. If you go into opportunities, it'll pop in uh, grants. Just click on grants, and you'll see all of our grants opportunities listed there. So the Neighborhood and Community Arts and the Put the Arts in Parks um, funding are on our website. It, the guidelines that you have in front of you, are, there's electronic versions of it there um, for both of those programs. The permit, uh, if you did not get the permit um, uh, cheat sheet, that's also on our website for the parks um, permitting that's needed. Uh, and also on our website and over here, Specifically for the Put the Arts in Parks, um, if you are a representative or if you have your uh, are associated with multiple organizations, as many people I know are, um, we've also done some translations of into the four uh, primary languages outside of English uh, for the Put the Arts in Parks grant. So the guidelines are available also in Spanish, Chinese, um, Somali, and Vietnamese. So when you go to our website, you'll see, and you scroll down a little bit, you'll see start your application. You'll click start your application and it'll take you to our online portal, which is called Culture Grants, uh, Culture Grants uh, Online. Um, if you haven't started an application already or if you haven't applied to any of our funding through this program, you'll want to start, you'll want to hit create profile, which is up here. If you do, if you already have applied, You'll be a returning user, so you put in your username and password. One of the things is, is if you if you think you might have already applied, but you can't access it or you forgot what your username or what your password is, give me a call. It's better to give me a call and I can look at that up for you than for you to create a new profile because you'll get in there, you'll try to put in, you'll put in your EIN number, your tax ID number, and it'll say, oh, we can't 
you'll spend all that time, we can't create a new profile for you because you already exist in our system. Um, so, or you'll make, you know, the previous one accidentally had an EIN typo in it or an SSN typo or your new one has some sort of typo in it and it'll allow you to create a new one. But all of your previous applications are in the old profile, which might have helped you fill out this year's application. So it's better to have that history than just to keep on creating new pro profiles for ease. Um, so if that's an issue, give me a call. Uh, you'll also, once you get in there, you'll need, if you are going through a fiscal sponsor, you'll need to link to the fiscal sponsor, and you'll need the fiscal sponsor's tax ID number, so get that ahead of time. Is there a question? What is it's on almost every single sheet of paper over there. <laughs> um, I think my business, unless those are all gone. Uh, but it's jenny.crooks at seattle.gov. J-E-N-N-Y dot C-R-O-O-K-S at seattle.gov. So you should have my, you should have it somewhere in triplicate <laughs> if you've got any of those, um, any of those sheets of paper over there. So once you get into the system and you've uh, typed in your profile and all of that, this is what, and you click on, uh, if it doesn't come up for you automatically, uh, it should, but if you were in there previously or somebody else was in there before you previously, um, you'll just click on applications, what will be on the far left side, and then this is what will pop up for you. So this is a list of all of our funding applications and the history that is open, and you'll see where you were funded or where you weren't funded. Um, or what you applied for, or what you didn't apply for, or what you started an application for. So that's why I said make sure that if you started an application or if you started a profile that you are in there because otherwise that way you'll see all the years that you've had funding for. Um, so what's going to matter to you are these last two rows right here. One says Neighborhood and Community Arts 2016 to 2017 and one says Put the Arts in Parks. So depending on which one you're applying for, you'll come over to this where it says current activity. And instead of where it says continue application here, it'll actually say start application if you haven't started one yet. So you'll just click start application and then it'll put you into that corresponding application. Does that make sense? Great. So you'll just want to make sure which one you're applying for, either NCA or the put the arts and parks and then click Start Application for each one. If you're applying for both, you'll need to click both eventually. Yeah? Do you have a, um, an application for a temporary installation project that you mentioned? Also, uh, I'm not going over that because it's a totally different system. It's our call for entry, but uh, yes, there are workshops for that. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is that available there online? It's available on our website, yeah. and if I have Wi-Fi, I can pull that up for you at the end of... No, it's... But sorry, my question is that, is that available to apply for both? If oh, uh, can you apply for both? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, so if you're a single artist, you can technically apply for both. You will probably only receive funding for one or the other because, like I said, this funding for both of those projects are coming from the same pool and we try to limit double dipping as much as we can. Now, what I would suggest is because the Put the Arts in Parks is really based in community events, most of that time to be a community event or authentic community event, you have multiple partners to help produce it. That just because you're involved in a community event doesn't preclude you, preclude that event from applying. So I would suggest your partner then apply or some other organization you're applying with. So if um, if a project involves temporary installation and then an event to you know share that installation or maybe interactive installation in a public park. So just look at what is more important to myself or obviously. Look at what's more important to yourself. Um, that one's sort of for so that one's for like, how shall I say, the installation portion of this is really focused on installation. This one, um, the event, so what I'm calling the events activation of it, so where there's dance or concert or some sort of performative aspect of it, um, it could have some temporary art associated with it, but that would all need to be filed under this one 
budget and you would need to check with parks to make sure that that was allowable. So these events could actually have an, a, like a weekend long installation aspect to it and it would be folded into this if you didn't want to apply for the other one. But if you have any other questions, give me a call and we can, if you're like, here's that gray area, let me know. Uh, okay, so once you click that start, the, um, start your application, both of these applications look exactly alike, so that's why we've combined this. Once again, that's why I said we combined this workshop. Now, it's really great because they both look alike, and it's really awful because they both look alike to make sure which one you know that you're applying for. Um, so we've asked for a few special instructions that once you get into the application, the actual application portion of it, so here it says application information. I'm sorry, this is so small. Uh, but on this side, this is on the left hand side are all part all the parts of the application that you'll be filling through so you can kind of see your progress as you're filling it out the top part of the application information is just contact and that can usually be folded from when you set up your profile like the name address and all of that stuff so I'm right now this is the view that you would get when you hit the project proposal part of the application we have some special instructions right here it's super helpful if you can if you can like follow them. If you forget to, you will not be disqualified. It just makes things a little bit more difficult for us to contact you and um, on the back end of things uh, from the standpoint of if there are any follow-up questions, it just means a little bit more legwork when, once you've submitted your application. So what we're asking is, even though, say you submitted neighborhood uh, hit start application for the neighborhood and community arts, it says NCA up here. It'll give you an application number and then it'll say Neighborhood and Community Arts. If you hit the Start the Application for Put the Arts in Parks, it will also give you an application number and it will also say Neighborhood and Community Arts. <laughs> so, um, that's, that's why we have these special instructions here. We're trying to make this system work um, as easily as, as best we can. Unfortunately, it was a system that was created before this application was created, and so we're trying to make it work, and there are some things that we need to just try our darndest at. The reason why we're doing this is because at the back end of it, it will make it so much easier for you to submit your final reports and invoices, especially if you're applying for both. Um, so that's why we're doing it this way. I know it's confusing, I'm gonna apologize now, but that's why we're trying to do it all through this one system. So what we're asking is in this project description right here, this is really where you would say, um, just a one sentence or two sentence description of what your event or project is. This is an event that will take place in um, three parks throughout Seattle. It will provide dance, um, dance, it's a dance series that'll happen in three parks in Seattle you can name those parts, yada, yada, yada. What we're asking is just if this application is intended for Put the Arts in Parks, put PAP in brackets just at the first part of that description. If it's for NCA, put NCA. If this project application is a project that's eligible for both, put both on there. That way, if you submit to the wrong application, I will go in and I'll say, oh, well, this is in this pile, and it's really supposed to be over here, and I can do that for you. If it's not in there, I'm gonna be giving you a call and trying to follow up with you, so it's really then dependent on you getting back to me after the deadline is complete. Once again, you will not be disqualified if you don't do this. It just means that I'll be able to contact you faster if there's an issue. Or I'll be able to move ahead and just copy it for you. Or if you put in both and you forgot to actually apply for both by October 30th, I'll cut and paste it for you in their system and send you an email and say, hey, I did this for you just so that you know you might have gotten an email or something from that as opposed to calling you and waiting for you to give me a call back to see if that's what you intended to do. So um, this is the project proposal part of the application. This is, um, this is a bigger version of what I just said before. So you'll fill this out. It'll be the name of the event, the basic who, what, where, when, all of that stuff in that like two sentence description. This is not where the pan what the panel is looking at. It's just a two sentence description. Essentially what you'd have on a website or when you're sending it to um, 
an event calendar or something like that, right? Where you just want a quick description of it. And then you fill out here, um, fill out any of the information here as well. The um, under requested amount, if you're applying for NCA, it'll be 1200. If you're applying for the under the P, uh, put the arts and parks, you'll put in that um, the level of funding. So it could be 1200, 24, 148, et cetera. Jumping over to what makes for a strong narrative and what things you should include. There's three parts to the narrative portion of the application. So that's the project description, the organization background and capacity. When we say organization, once again, we weren't able to change the questions for it. So um, if you're an individual that's applying uh, for Put the Arts in Parks, you're you're that organization, so you can speak from that kind of history. Um, if it's not an official organization, if it's like a group of neighbors or a, a, just a group of people and not a formal organization, you can talk about that. Um, that also is under the organization section. And the last one is the community building through arts and culture. So um, I had mentioned the three criteria that the panel will be looking at, and here's just a little um, diagram to show you essentially where that pan where the panel is getting like the bulk of its information for when it's looking uh, for its scoring criteria. So project description will kind of give them information when they're scoring the quality of the overall project. Organization background and capacity will give um, help them with their feasibility scoring. And community building through arts and culture will help with that community impact criteria. By all means, these are not the only things that will feed into this consideration, but they are the bulk of where the narrative will match with it. Of course, feasibility feasibility might also take into account budget, well, might, will take into account budget and that sort of thing as well. So the project narrative. Um, your basic, this is just a little breakdown of how the questions are asked. In here, uh, project description, describe your festival, highlight specific arts components, how will funds be used, what partnerships are involved, the organization background and capacity, history, what's the history of arts programming and presenting activities. Once again, you can speak from an individual's perspective if you're applying for that neighborhood, for the, put the arts and parks. Um, community building through the arts and culture, the types of questions that we're looking for answers there is who is your audience, how will you build community relations, and how will you engage with underserved communities. Um, and lastly, how do you plan to reach your audience? So this is a little bit of a combination of who's in your audience, but also who, how are you doing some of your promotional outreach, and what's actually happening at the event that helps build that audience. Yes? Can I just underscore one of those points? Of course. For Put the Arts in Parks, it's a really, it, it will behoove you to really outline how you are reaching out to underserved communities with your event, whether it's in the neighborhood of the park that you want to activate or your event itself because that is one of the underlying philosophical points of this particular initiative. And the Parks Oversight Committee, the folks, the Citizen Oversight Committee that oversees um, the Seattle uh, Lake, or the, sorry, the Seattle Park District, that's clearly one thing that they do want to see demonstrated in that initiative. So if you can demonstrate that, your application will be much stronger. Thank you. You're welcome. So project description. I gave a brief overview of the questions that we're asking under project description. Here are some of the types of answers that we're looking for. So when you're describing your event, you want to expand on that brief description that you included in the project, that sort of two sentence. The who, what, where, when is really important to that. So describe what, uh, who's at your event, who's putting on the event. So once again, if it's the, the Put the Arts and Parks as well as our neighborhood and community arts is really meant to serve underserved communities and support those communities. So if the event is coming from the community itself and not just serving that community, you're gonna wanna highlight both aspects of that here. Um, describe activities that are happening during the event. Are there children's activities? Are there dance performances, um, music workshops, etc.? Those kinds of things. What makes, your pro uh, what makes this event or project really unique and exciting? And then, are there any other new directions for the event? So as far as the neighborhood and community event, uh, neighborhood and community arts projects are concerned, that is one that has, um, like I said, it's, it has to have happened at least once before, so there's some history to the event. I often try and tell folks, don't just cut and paste from your last year's application or your two years ago application into this one and um, think that it's gonna be as strong as it was before. Sometimes they wanna know 
what were your successes last year and what are you building on for this new event? So cover both of those. What are the stronghold aspects of the event and how are you expanding or what's new about it? Um, as far as when it's talking about highlighting arts components, um, don't just say we'll be showcasing arts from the Seattle area. Give us some ideas. Is it really a focus on visual arts? Is it a focus on dance, music, film, et cetera? Is it all of them? Is it one of them? <coughs> what aspects are it? Name specific groups. A lot of you <coughs> are, may not already have these. If it's um, a festival kind of thing, you might already have the groups uh, selected because it's happening eight months from now. Um, give, it's a good idea to maybe give past examples, or if you are lucky enough to have some of those groups already signed on from the previous year, you can say we already have this group and we're re reaching out to these three groups kind of thing. If um, For some of it, it's good to just, depending on what it is, like sometimes they're a uh, juried arts festival in a neighborhood, you might want to hit upon what the selection process, is it lottery, is it invitation, is it juried, and why is it that? Um, each of these have pros and cons to them, so why choosing one versus the other? Why are you showcasing these groups? And then include any participatory activities. So if there's children's activities where they'll have hands-on um, experience with it. Then these are pretty self-explanatory. How will the funds be used? Um, enlist partnerships. I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on how the funds would be used. One sentence if it's going towards supporting artist fees or if you're looking at really bringing in an artist that's an international artist for some reason and it's going to that because it's that person has a really strong connection to what you're trying to do with the project. Um, one sentence can probably answer that. I've seen some narratives where it goes, spends a lot more time on this. This is really the bulk of it. And then lastly, list partnerships. Okay, so in a pre previous question, you said, you know, you, you told somebody, gosh, I don't know if I'm expressing this very well. You told somebody that um, to, that their partner could apply for a, another grant, they would apply for mm -hmm. one grant and their partner could apply for another grant. So would you list that partnership in list partnerships? Um, yes. Um, you might also be able to include an organization background and capacity. So if there, I think the question that I answered what you're referring to is really about individuals. So if that individual has a strong staff, um, uh, is a strong lead on it, you might want to touch upon a little bit of their background and organization background and capacity section. Okay, so you could have um, two partners pieing for two different grants in, for the same event. Mm -mm. Yeah. The event, only, the event can only receive funding through. See, that's what I was trying to get. Okay, yeah. No, you couldn't have like partner A submitting an application and partner B submitting an application for the same event. My question, or my answer was, we have this other funding program that's okay. for the installation. So if that individual artist wanted to submit for the, for the installation, which is mainly for individual artists and some like arts um, teams, if they were if they were involved in an event, they could have somebody else submit an application for this. And being involved in an event does not preclude them from submitting an application from that event submitting an application. Does that make sense? You can't have two applications for the same event going through this program. Okay. Yes. If you have a que if you have a question about that, give me a call. If there's something, I'll let you know. Uh, nope, I didn't say the other one. Sorry. Organization, background, and capacity. <coughs> Excuse me. So neighborhood uh, for this one, you're looking at history, significant staff, and partnerships on here as well. Um, the partnerships really being like the producing partners. If there's any history that you need to put in here. But as far as history goes, for neighborhood and community arts, because that needs to be previously produced, you might highlight how many years have you produced the event. Uh, for Put the Arts in Parks, if it's a new event, describe some of those previously produced events and include successes, attendance, etc. Um, these aren't uh, um, 
these are sort of the elements of the question. So I think your question was somebody, if you've produced other things before, you'll highlight it there. For, at the 1200 level, you might focus, for put the arts in parks, you might focus on the significant staff or sig significant per uh, personnel and partnerships a little bit more. So significant staff, um, specific areas of ex expertise, if there's volunteers, the number of volunteers that you have supporting an event, that kind of thing. And then partnerships, if whether they're individual partners or communities or businesses or groups can all go in there. You'll describe those as well. The last narrative question is community building through arts and culture. So here's the parts of the question under that first part, which is where you might want to describe who your audience is. I say be specific. Um, a lot of these events, they'll say our events are for everyone. That's great. We figure that they have to be open and accessible to the public, but that's really not enough. We know that if you help target some of your activities to a specific group, it actually makes your connection to those groups deeper and not just saying anybody can come and if, if everybody's saying anybody 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 can come it makes it really hard for you to say this is an event I connect with or this is an event I connect with um, so some of those things you want to say is demographic or geographic community that you're trying to reach um, or the demographic and geographic community that this event is coming from uh, who's producing it is it family friendly uh, you know are there activities for all age groups is it uh, targeted to a specific age group that's um, but once again open to the public and like I said do not just say everybody can come and think that that answers that question specifically you can certainly include that that it's open to everybody and we're welcoming of everyone um, but who are some of those really specific groups that you're trying to have your project reach how will you build and engage the community so is this what are the benefits to um, to the community or to your community if it's a neighborhood because for the put the arts in parks if it's happening in those neighborhoods if you're trying to activate that specific park for your neighborhood um, and it's coming from that group you may want to describe that a little bit more here why is this event important are there cultural benefits economic social justice environmental awareness are these some of the things that you're trying to raise awareness around or benefit the community in some way lastly a pub, uh, there's that sort of public outreach um, or promotional outreach aspect of it so if you're going through media don't just say you're sending out press releases it's good to n name some of those specific publications that you're out doing outreach to are they neighborhood blogs cultural publications etc that really key into the demographics you're trying to reach um, who are the partners who are helping you with promotional outreach what are any of those efforts to reach new communities underserved communities that you haven't reached already um, and then any accessibility efforts so for neighborhood and community arts like I said is if it's a ticketed event Maybe you're charging a $15 ticket price, but you have free or discounted tickets available. You might mention who those are going to, or is it youth, is it um, partnering groups or something like that. Um, is it ADA accessible? Do you have American uh, Sign Language interpretation for your events? Do you have other translators available at your events? Um, will it be in multi-languages? And then also, you might, if you haven't already touched upon this, you could talk about perhaps your choice of location in that section as well as to relating to accessibility. Any questions? So this is a quick overall of it, but the narrative tips, really be specific. Address the program criteria. So like I said, that's why I said looking at those narrative questions and kind of how they match the program criteria. Make sure that you're looking at both. Include new efforts in there. Avoid redundancy, so don't just say the same. Sometimes those questions are the same, uh, or sometimes the answers will look very similar from one question to the other. There is a word limit or a character limit in these, so make sure that you're using those characters to the best of your advantage and giving new information in each of those narrative sections. And um, Like I said, character count, you want to say more with less. Don't just go on for pages and pages. One of the things um, that I forgot to touch upon is some folks who, um, I, I sometimes do, it's easier to write it in a Word document and then cut and paste to the application because you can save that and have people make edits if, multi, if a lot of people are working on it. 
you can certainly do that, cut and paste from the Word document. Just know that um, our system, our Culture Grants Online, does not always recognize all um, characters from Word. So if you do cut and paste, go back in and just kind of read through it because if you're having an issue with character limit and you're like, I checked it in Word and it's 500 characters but it's not letting me fill it out, it's because it might not recognize quotation marks. Instead of just putting a quotation mark as one character, it's actually putting like question mark ABD <laughs> slash on it and that's taking up four of your characters. So um, you can do that, just go back and check the character count. Also, um, the other way to do it is if you just have a plain text that you're writing. Of course, that's harder to like track people's edits in if it's multiple people working on it. Once again, it won't be held against you in the um, review of the application if we see like a weird character. I always inform our panel that, that, that it's really an issue with the system, so don't fret about that. The last thing that I do want to say is um, Make sure that the content is in there regarding your project, and that's really the most important thing, that the content is the most important thing, and not necessarily how florid is the writing or anything like that. Um, the last part of the application is the budget part. So there's two parts to the budget, the budget expenses and the budget income. It's not the most user-friendly, and I will apologize for this as well. Um, there's a lot of tabbing you have to do, so you can't just cut and paste from your like Excel budget to here. You actually have to type it all out individually. I apologize. <laughs> um, the salaries and fees, so here the salaries and fees, it kind of names all the main expenses that you'll have here. Um, use the note boxes right here. The add row if you have multiple kind of um, uh, multiple items under under one of these sort of headings. And then last but not least, you'll also include non-cash items in this section. So volunteers who are helping with the actual event or project, you might put under salaries and fees non-artists up there and just list them as it like event volunteers um, oh, I have it over here so if you put this here I might you can put musician fees for example would be typed into here when you hit the notes you can expand upon that and say six musicians at two hundred dollars equals uh, which is twenty five dollars times eight hours equals twelve hundred a piece and then that full amount with twelve hundred would go right there. And it'll then tabulate it all for you <coughs> as you go. I didn't understand. You know the volunteer hours as part of the budget, but then you don't yeah. pay them? Yes. So that's help that's helping with the match. And it's putting a cash value to the work that they're doing because if they weren't donating your time, yeah. you'd have to pay so for it. Like a pro bono thing. Exactly. So if anybody's donating their time, if the artists are donating and the reason, thank you for bringing this up. Once again, I go, one of the issues that we had with a budget that, for a project that wasn't funded um, one time, one of the issues with the budget was their artists were donating their time and they didn't account for it in the budget. So the whole narrative was talking about how many singers and all of that, that they, musicians that they were going to have. And then we looked at the budget and we saw no singers, no musicians in the budget whatsoever. So we're thinking, how are they going to put on this event? They say they're having singers, but there's nobody here. If, so putting that donated value of their time at least acknowledged, oh, okay, the artists are donating their time. So then do you just specify in the line item, the word, like the word volunteer? Yeah, that's I would go. say, or in kind or whatever you can put okay. in that note section. And would you put zero there? or because I put the cash value there. Okay. Because then it'll add up. So, so, so what's the cash value of their time? An hourly rate. Is it 2025 or 20 um, years? Sometimes, if it's easier for you, you could put like what the uh, stipend is if you could do it. So maybe it's $100 for that it would be the value of their time at that event. Maybe it's $50 per person. If you want to go by arts, um, our 
what we try to pay artists per hour is $50 an hour. Um, if it's volunteers who are helping set up the event, minimum wage in Seattle is $15 an hour right now, so you could go, to, and we're encouraging folks to at least move towards that in philosophy, even if they are volunteering their time, to maybe account for $15 per hour when you're accounting for like volunteer time at a minimum. It, it'll add up to more because then we'll go the income section is below here so we'll see what income you have coming in okay, so kind of like if you're doing the NCA would ideally add up to 2400 because you have 1200 of no the NCA would uh, probably you're requesting 1200 from us more often than not your event is going to be well surpassed that okay. whether it's in kind don't even if the cash that you're paying on the event when you calculate the volunteer hours, when you calculate that the stage was donated or whatever, the event actually takes more than that. Say all you're doing for the NCA or the Put the Arts in Parks is using this to pay for artist fees. Yeah. You still have the stage costs and volunteer costs to actually manage the event. Uh, the food for Put the Arts in Parks, there might be a food cost to it. So all of those are gonna be probably above and beyond that. Speaking of, if we are providing food at our event, yeah, you can list it. Our funds just couldn't cover it. Um, oh, can it include the volunteer hours, uh, the time that was put in prior to putting the event, or does it need to be on the actual <coughs> event, the hours that are counted for volunteers and artists? Can it like for a rehearsal for the? It could include the rehearsal space. So if it's an event, if it's a a musical performance and you need to rehearse, rent the space for it, it can include this rental. Okay, and as far as payment to the artists um, or volunteers that have, you know, there's lots of hours that go before the actual event, mm -hmm. is that included as part of the hours posted as payment to volunteers? It's not payment to volunteers, just their worth or, or not, only the day of the event. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't if there's volunteers that need to do, like sometimes you'll have people who go and put the posters up and they're volunteering their time to promote the event, you could include that cost or volunteer time as well. It sounds like the labor, the labor, volunteer yeah. labor needed to make the event happen, whether it takes place on the day of the event or it takes Correct. place before the Thank event, you. Yeah. can be counted. Yes. So, you were at, so that was just a focus on the project expenses. Here's the project income. So um, earned income, if it's NCA, remember we allowed that you could have an admission cost if you needed to. Um, so that could be under earned income. For Put the Arts in Parks, <coughs> you aren't able to have it. It has to be free and open to the public. But say you sell t-shirts at the event or something like that, that could be part of the earned income. So the event itself is free, but you were selling t-shirts, that would count as earned income. Any of your own money or the organization's money, Family, friends, individual donations. So if you had a crowdfunding or crowdsourcing, or if you had that jar from last, if you had a donation jar from last year that was helping this year, that would go under that friends, families, and individual donations. And then here's those three grant um, items. If you got any other grants, whether they are applied for, confirmed, or anticipated, you can include those costs here. So government, business, corporation, private foundation can all go in there. Um, and then the last part, so non-cash income, this is basically where you'd account for all of the volunteer item, items and hours and people that were up in your expenses could all come into this box here. And then any other income that didn't fit in this. So this, once again, uh, the uh, project income needs to balance with the project expenses. So you'll probably need to account for um, some non-confirmed at this point if you're still raising funds for it. Can I ask a question? Yeah. If, if part of our budget includes planning for next year, would the our income then be a little bit more than our expenses for this year's festival? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I would, I would focus on this year's project and make sure that the project balances because it won't let you submit okay. if it doesn't. Um, and then these little buttons are really important all along the way. Hit save every single time you make adjustments. That goes both for the narrative section as well as for this budget <coughs> section here. 
Anyways, that's the end of the application. If you have any questions along while you're filling it out, always hit me an email or give me a call. Email I can usually answer a little bit faster, so if you're able to do that, um, email tends to be the way to go, but I, I can also do phone calls. If funded, um, this so you've submitted your application notification, you found out that you were funded for either of these projects, this is basically the steps that you'll need from there. You'll need to obtain a City of Seattle business license if you don't already have one. That cost can be included in the budget for it. Um, I think it's $110 for large organizations, $55 for small organizations. And if your event, uh, if you need to get it, um, and your event is happening in the later part of 2016, both of those costs are cut in half as well because it's for a calendar year. You'll sign a letter of agreement uh, with us. Uh, you'll need to get your permits and insurance, etc. especially looking at that sheet for the Put the Arts in Parks. Um, once your event comes around and you're promoting it, you'll need to give credit to the Office of Arts and Culture and the City of Seattle Parks and Recreation for Pro Put the Arts in Parks projects before and during your event. Um, and we'll have those logos available on our website. Our logos are already available. Our logo is available on the website. So and we'll, we'll get you our logo we'll to be, have at the same website. And we'll um, add uh, parks on there as well. And then submit an invoice, final evaluation, promotional item which has those logos on it. And photos are not um, required, but we always appreciate them before you're receiving funds. You'll need to submit those within 30 days after the event or by that deadline, December 15th or 30th, uh, depending on what your project is. Um, the funds will be, I should say, the Neighborhood and Community Arts um, will be reimbursement based, so that just means after your project is complete. Neighborhood and Community Arts, for anything 2400 and above, we may be able to do a split. I haven't been able to confirm that yet. We just need to see that our system works with that, but you may be able to ask for half before and half after. Okay, questions. We're a little, um, uh, little short on time, so I just wanna, we'll have to sneak out there and I can ask some questions, answer some questions in the lobby, but we do have a little bit of time right now. Is there a, there's not uh, an item of, about insurance in the budget. You can, uh, there was a, a under expenses, so insurance is on there uh, under, under other. Okay. Yeah, so you can include insurance for the event on there. Um, how, what's the total number of grants or total amount of money for each of these? So Neighborhood and Community Arts, um, it's a two year funding, so a, we have funding from last year that's rolling over to this year. It used, um, and then this year we're selecting new programs that'll be from this year to the following year, or from 2016 to 17. Each year, we fund a t um, we select twenty applications for that, but it means we have a total of twenty of forty projects that are funded through our neighborhood community arts each year. But because it's that two year, it's twenty projects right. will be selected through this. Um, the put the arts in parks, we don't have an exact number on it. I'm guessing if every from what I've calculated, um, because of those different funding levels. So if we get a lot of like really strong smaller events, we could do more if we get a lot of stronger large requesting events we'd be doing less the average would probably be about 40 for that as well if everybody's funded it sort of that average amount for NCA um, we received 60 applications last year for those 20 spots but some of those may be eligible for the Put the Arts in Parks this year, so it might be kind of spreading the love a little bit more. If we qualify for both, which one would, be, would we be offered if there is a, a cost difference? The well, one is 1200 for two years, right? And the other has various Right. We follow up most likely we'd follow up with you if there if it was like 24 if you could either get the 2400 or the 1,200 over two years, 2,400 in one year, or the 1,200 uh, over two years, mm -hmm. I'd be following up with you and saying, hey, which do you prefer? Because okay. essentially those are the same, right? Like, I, so I'd give you an option. If you were selected for Put the Arts in par Parks at a higher, if you applied for Put the Arts in Parks at a higher level than Neighborhood and Community Arts, I'd, I'm assuming you'd probably cho choose the higher funding, but I'd probably, so we might go with that. We'll see how everything folds um, in the panel process. We'd be giving you 
whatever was more money most likely though. Or we'd be selecting you for whatever is more money, depending on which one. Neighborhood and Community Arts does, so you couldn't receive funding through our core program, Civic Partners, City Artists, or Smart Ventures. Aside from that, um, if you got funding through Put the Arts in Parks, you could maybe still receive funding through the other ones. Civic par I, I leave out Civic Partners because the Civic Partners funding is actually, a, they're doing the review of that this year, and that's a two-year funding, so you wouldn't be applying for that anyway. from the other ones. You could still apply for youth arts funding though. Okay. Put the arts in parks, you'd still be uh, eligible for the other ones. What about for culture? Uh, we have nothing to do with for culture, so you can apply to them. They're the King County option, King County funding, so we don't, our funding doesn't overlap with theirs. Any other questions? A lot of information. I know I sort of threw it out to get it all out to you. Um, and so if you have, if you go back, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Uh, I will say again, if your name is not already on that list, I'll send out this PowerPoint um, to anybody as long as your email is legible on there. Um, so you will be able to follow through if you need to forward this to somebody else who might be helping you with the application or something like that. Thank you, and thank you for the help setting up in the chairs and all of that. Thank you. Oh, yes, and if you, um, the surveys, if you don't mind leaving them here, I really appreciate it if you could fill out those and leave them. Yeah, just fold them up if you need to. Yeah, thanks for coming. So,
I just made art. What sounds are you? I like the sounds. It's a giant. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, you need to email me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, you need to email me. Yeah. And I will try to find out what we know, what our what our crews know about that. Is it is it interior accessible anymore? Because I don't need permission to be part of the city's water supply. It might have been seized. We don't think I get any there. We don't have a reason to get in there. We're going to say all the time. It's also not impossible that it might yeah. still be under the jurisdiction well, of the public utilities that runs the water supply. Yeah, I, I, I and I think it's nice to be able to do that. If you want to have some. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I don't know the answer to any of them, but that's um, okay. Right. You know, on Monday, we're going to send out all this stuff, and I send that out to them as well. I that. It's going to be in the garden the 29th. Okay. So, I did yeah. Yeah. So we do have yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Yeah.